Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, February 12th, 2015. Now, there's a lot of hand-wringing that's going on about the anti-vaxxers, as the people who typically like to portray themselves as being pro-choice demand that vaccines be mandatory, and they're so concerned that it's the affluent and well-educated who are not getting vaccinated. This is a story out of MSN.com. They say Pixar's daycare has one of the lowest vaccination rates in Silicon Valley. They say the tech and science capital of the world where self-driving cars, futuristic goggles are part of the landscape also seems to be a hotbed of anti-vaxxers. Maybe they know something you don't. Maybe they want answers. Maybe they can calculate percentages. Maybe they understand what risk is and they want to be informed and they aren't getting the, quite, the answers that they want to see, so they're not giving their consent. But of course, there's a big pushback in California, as we'll see. They point out that Disney is the worst offender. They say only 43% of children at Pixar-affiliated daycare center were up to date on their shots, according to California state records. They say this has largely affected the children of educated and affluent parents, this outbreak in California right now. Of course, they offer no proof of that. We do know that the vaccination rates of, of the people who have been vaccinated, we do know that 14% of the people in this particular outbreak had been vaccinated, yet they continue to repeat that the vaccine is 99% effective. Perhaps that's why the educated and the affluent aren't buying the phony numbers about efficacy. Yet Wired Magazine, which originally ran this data, is now talking about, we need to have a change in the approach. See, we've done the bad cop thing. Now maybe we need to do the good cop thing. They say there's been a lot of shaming and blaming of the anti-vaccination crowd. And then they go on to repeat that every unvaccinated kid at school threatens the greater community's protection against the disease. I'm sorry, I don't believe that. Like I said, when they don't talk about the real numbers, when there's 14% of the people who got vaccinated that get the disease in this outbreak, 18% in the last outbreak in California a year ago had been vaccinated. That's only an 82% effective rate in that particular case. Yet they continue to repeat as if it was a religious dogma that the vaccines are 99% effective. And of course, there was a 2011 case in New York where 100% of the people who came down with measles were either had records of being vaccinated twice, patient zero had been vaccinated twice and had the records, two of the four people who caught it from her had been vaccinated twice and had records, the other two had indications in their blood that they had been vaccinated. Nevertheless, they're going to continue to shame and blame the anti-vaxxers for the failure and the lies of the pharmaceutical industry. But it's not just Wired Magazine. It's very interesting to see that there are multiple publications, multiple news sites coming out on the very same day saying, we need to change the strategy about the way that we approach these anti-vaxxers. Maybe we need a kindler, gentler form of medical tyranny. Maybe it's not enough just to be the bad cop and say, get your damn kids vaccinated. Maybe we need to say, oh, let me hold your hand and tell you a little bit about this. This is exactly what Reuters says. A softer, less strident outreach may help to calm U.S. vaccine skeptics. And then they go on to say about three paragraphs in the article, as measles cases have spread in the U.S. and a new outbreak of mumps has sickened at least 23 people in the northwest states of Idaho and Washington, much attention has been focused on parents who decline some or all vaccinations for their children. Oh, but wait a minute. What about that vaccine, that mumps outbreak in Washington and Idaho? We've got a story from Adon Salazar on Infowars.com today that lays that firmly at the feet of the vaccines. Two people contract mumps after receiving the mumps vaccine. That would be the MMR vaccine. And of course, with the MMR vaccine, you're vaccinated with live versions of mumps, measles, and rubella at the same time. As I pointed out many times, we said many times, back in the early 60s when I was a kid, they didn't have a vaccine. What parents did was they got real lifetime immunity for their children by exposing them to the vaccines at an age where they weren't a baby, where they weren't an old person or somebody that was a grown up. They would send you down to the house to get measles from your neighbor when they came down with measles. But they wouldn't send you from that neighbor who had measles to another neighbor who had mumps to another neighbor who had rubella and have you try to fight off all three diseases at once. And of course, that's not the only problem with these vaccines. It's also the adjuvants that they put in to irritate, purposely to irritate the immune system. Is it any wonder 
that we have so many autoimmune diseases, that we have so many allergies. In this story from Don Salazar, he says, doctors in Washington are scrambling to explain why two MMR vaccine recipients contracted the mumps virus after being vaccinated. Yeah, please explain that to me. When you can explain that to me, then I will be informed. And perhaps I will give you my consent, but not until you can come up with a plausible explanation. CBS affiliate KIRO reports that two people from two separate counties, King and Sohomish, contracted the mumps post-MMR vaccination, blaming the two-person outbreak on mumps cases leading out of the University of Idaho. And of course, what do you get when you get the mumps? As they point out, you get headaches, fever, facial swelling. It sounds very much like these kinds of pharmaceutical ads that you see on Fox News and CNN, the very media that are pushing mandatory vaccines, a clear conflict of interest. We see commercials all the time from the large pharmaceutical companies for minor conditions. And then as they're showing you these beautiful pictures in fields with butterflies and dogs running in the high grass, they run off this litany of very dangerous, serious side effects that you can have. So to spare you from the mumps where you might have headaches, fever, and facial swelling, they're going to expose you to things like death, for example. As Adon points out in his article, the Immunization Action Coalition, the IAC, admits that the MMR vaccine, which has live strains of measles, mumps, and rubella, may, quote, cause a very mild case of the disease they were designed to prevent, and specifically in there, the insert lists death as one of the associated adverse reactions. But of course, as we saw in the 2011 outbreak in New York, one of the reasons that it spread to as many people as it did was because they could not believe that the measles could be spread from a vaccinated person. They said, the most you can get is measles-like symptoms. But of course, we're not going to call that measles. And of course, you cannot spread this to someone else. So their blind adherence to this dogma that is coming out of the CDC is exactly what caused it to spread in that case. So we've seen that measles can be spread from someone uh, vaccinated with the MMR. We see that mumps can be spread from someone with the MMR. Nevertheless, in California, we have a move afoot to remove exemptions, people's personal belief. That's what I would call consent. They want to remove people who object to it either because they don't feel that uh, they've been informed fully and they don't give their consent, can't have that. Or because maybe they've got religious objections to it, can't have that. We're going to run roughshod over that. As the LA Times points out and applauds Gary Brown, they say California Governor Gary Brown appears open to restricting vaccine waivers. How open-minded of him, isn't that great? He's going to be open to mandates against your consent. Here's the way they put it, Governor Jerry Brown, who preserved religious exemptions to state vaccination requirements in 2012 on Wednesday, however, appeared open to legislation that would eliminate all but medical waivers. The governor's new flexibility, they go on to say. Flexibility. Flexibility to remove your religious freedom, to remove your informed consent, to enact a medical tyranny on you. That's his new flexibility. That's pretty amazing. So, you know, what does it really mean for public health when we can just have contempt for individuals' rights? What does it mean for public health when the herd immunity is more important than individual health? We're going to be talking to a physician who is head of the Association for uh, the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons. We're going to be talking to her in our interview today. That is an organization that is very concerned about preserving the sanctity of the patient and doctor relationship. It's something we should be very concerned about. There is a lot of dangerous conflict of interest when we have third parties come in and mandate things for in the doctor-patient relationship. Third parties like the government, like insurance companies, like pharmaceutical companies. Now, of course, doctors are not perfect either. You should have a second opinion on anything that's serious, but we should preserve that doctor-patient relationship, that individual focus, the idea that we should have a say in life and death health issues. Nevertheless, we see Johnson & Johnson now is aiming to spot who will get a disease. This is kind of like a minority report for medical tyranny. No conflict of interest here when Johnson & Johnson is going to be diagnosing you and then selling you the solution to the diagnosis they give you. They say that the company is aimed at nothing less than redefining healthcare. They say they're going to find ways to prevent 
common, frightening, deadly disorders. And of course, those solutions will be coming from Johnson & Johnson. Here's an example. They say already today, we know that uh, blood testing and then using cholesterol-lowering statin pills to prevent heart attacks. Oh, wait a minute, right there. Look at the side effects from statin drugs. I would never use statin drugs personally. There are a lot of very dangerous side effects. I've looked at the information. You don't have my consent. But that's the kind of thing they're going to be doing. They're going to be diagnosing you, telling you that you have a health condition, and then telling you what you need to do for that. And of course, they point out in the article that Johnson & Johnson is a leading maker of diagnostic tests, which they'll be selling you, vaccines, they'll be selling you surgical equipment, prescription pills, injected biologic medicines, and consumer health products. This is why we need to have a doctor-patient relationship apart from these third parties. And certainly, a doctor can sell you something, a bad doctor can misdiagnose things, a bad doctor can prescribe things for you that uh, should not be done to you. You still have the ability to have multiple opinions, second opinions, and ultimately, it is your informed opinion that should matter. They point out that they're going to collaborate with university researchers, and the company made $16 billion last year. That's going to buy a lot of university researchers for that kind of money. And of course, when you fund the studies, you can pretty much get them to say whatever you want them to say. Now, it's not just medical tyranny, it is full spectrum tyranny. We see, of course, that Obama is announcing and they're sending out the signals and this is the way they always do it. He's going to have executive orders on the cybersecurity data threat. So we've seen this coming. They even point out in the article, this is something they're justifying based on the hack of Sony over the interview. That's not even a legitimate hack. It doesn't threaten anybody. Nobody was harmed with that. But most people say that it was an inside job. Security experts say that it was an inside job. It was not North Korea. Nevertheless, Obama hasn't been able to get CISPA through. The Democrats and those who want to run CISPA through, and I would say the Republicans want it as badly, if not more, so than the Democrats do. CISPA was Cyber Intelligence Sharing Protection Act. And so when they started talking about cyber intelligence sharing right after the Sony hack, you knew where this was going. You knew they were bringing back CISPA yet again. It's been defeated twice. The other earlier variants of it, SOPA, ACTA, PIPA, those have also been defeated, not only here in America, but abroad in Western democracies. So they're going to do it by executive order or they're going to do it by the treaties. They've, they've got multiple ways they're going to try to put this through. Now, intelligence sharing is not there to protect you. It's not there to protect the public. It's there to protect the snitches and multinational corporations who are collecting your data and turning this over to the government. It's to protect them from legal uh, charges as well as from lawsuits for violating your privacy. That's what the intelligence sharing is set up to protect. It's set up to protect the corporations from being sued. This is coming from Reuters. It says, President Barack Obama is expected to announce an executive order directing the government and companies to share more information. Of course, you know the government's not going to be sharing any information. They don't give us any information about anything, as we'll see in the next story. They're going to share information about cyberspace security threats in response to attacks like that on Sony Entertainment. And they point out, as in other policy areas where Obama has been unable to get legislation through the now Republican-controlled Congress, dot, 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 the White House is going to do whatever they want. Let's take an, an analogy. Let's say that you had a sheriff in town, and the sheriff said, I've been trying to get the, the town to pass a law to outlaw fill in the blank. I don't care what it is. I want them to outlaw that and put heavy fines and jail terms on that. But I just can't get the town council to do anything. So I'm going to start arresting and, and finding people on my own because they won't do what I tell them to do. That's exactly what Obama is doing. So we asked a question at Infowars.com. Why is Obama doing this? And of course, we all know the answer. They want to control the press. And the only free press that exists today is on the internet. In a story from Kit Daniels up on Infowars.com, Today, he says the mainstream media's declining influence is motivating the federal government to regulate the internet because controlling information is the most powerful way to control the public. Absolutely. That historically has been the case. And as he points out in the article, since uh, from 2012 to 2013, CNN and MSNBC 
dropped 59% and 52% in their audiences in a critical demographic of 25 to 54-year-olds. They also point out the combined median primetime viewership of CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC since 2013 has dropped 11%. You see, the news just isn't credible, just like the information, quote unquote, we're being given, being given by about vaccines. In another article on Infowars.com today, we see the court rules details of DHS cell phone service kill switch can remain a secret. Guess what? The government's not going to tell us anything about something it's doing. The government doesn't tell us anything about anything it's doing. In this particular case, we don't know anything about this secret program that can kill cell phone coverage in a particular area except the name of the program. It's SOP 303. Standard Operating Procedure 303. Standard Operating Procedure is to shut off all information and not tell us what they're doing. That's Standard Operating Procedure. They've got a name for it, SOP 303. I guess we should say SO3, SOP 303 for everything. They say the U.S. Court of Appeals, however, in Washington, has ruled now that the Department of Homeland Security's procedure for shutting down cell phone service during the declared emergency can remain secret. This was a lawsuit that was brought by the Electronic Privacy Information Center, EPIC, after the DHS failed to release its criteria for network shutdowns following an incident in 2011. See, they've already done it. They've already done it. This is not science fiction. This is not conspiracy theories. This is our wild imaginations. No, it was actually four years ago. Government officials in San Francisco disabled cell phone service during a peaceful protest. Disabled cell phone service during a peaceful protest. Why would you need to have cell phone service showing a peaceful protest? Well, it might be because the police are not planning on being peaceful. Nevertheless, they say the demonstration was against the police killing of Charles Hill, a homeless man who was shot dead by a Bay Area rapid transit officer. And as they point out, they tried to get information about what criteria do they use to shut it down. It isn't that we're looking to see if they have the capability. We know they have the capability. What are the criteria? The DHS initially said, well, we don't have any information about that. The agency is, quote, unable to locate or identify any responsive records. The judge didn't like that. The judge at the district court level ruled that the feds had improperly withheld the information, and he ordered its release. So then they filed an appeal, and now they don't have to talk. As Al Jazeera pointed out, your location data is your life, and police want it all. In this particular article, they're talking about using license plate readers to track your movements. Well, of course, as we've seen and reported, a couple of years back in 2009, the DEA was going to record license plates at gun shows. They were going to use the old technology of driving around and photographing license plates of people who had gone to gun shows. This is the DEA. This is not even the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. This is the Drug Enforcement Agency. And they were going to do that. They said that they didn't actually implement the plan once it was leaked to the ACLU and the ACLU asked for information about it. I'm sure they had better, higher tech ways of doing that. And of course, now they're monitoring our license plates everywhere we go and tracking our locations. And you should be worried about that. You should be even more worried about the fact that the federal government is planning on not only tracking your movements, but controlling your movements. Once you have a computer-controlled, government-controlled car, they will not only be able to track everywhere that you're going, but they will be able to restrict your movement. Controlling movement is a key cornerstone of tyranny, and they're working to effectively shut that down. At the same time, they're going to shut down the internet with kill switches, shut down your cell phone with kill switches, and spy on you. Of course, they have the Stingray program, and uh, they will not release information about that because they have something that is more important than a judicial order, that is more important than the Constitution, and that is a non-disclosure agreement with Harris Corporation, an electronics company. That's what the police told a judge when he said, I want to see the information about the Stingray program. They said, no, we can't do that. We've got a non-disclosure agreement. And he said, not with me, you don't, at which point they just removed the charges from the person because they will do anything for the corporations, they will do nothing to support the oath that they took to get their job, the oath they took to the Constitution. Well, stay with us right after the break. We have an amazing admission from a grandmother who gets ISIS to admit that the CIA is 
giving them weapons. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. Used since before the days of the Roman Empire to support the body's natural systems and enhance overall health. Introducing the new InfoWarsLife.com Oil of Oregano Formulation, a highly advanced nutraceutical form of this key herb that has been traditionally used by civilizations for thousands of years to promote health. We have now procured the most high quality and potent forms of oregano oil on the market, sourced from top leading manufacturers to ensure a concentrated level of bioactive ingredients extracted directly from the wild herb and sealed in easy to use capsules you will no longer need to endure the burning of liquid oregano on the tongue wild crafted from the mediterranean oregano species that experts agree is one of the most powerful and most challenging to acquire this winter season it's more important than ever to secure this true form of oil of oregano now available in our limited first run at infowarslife.com that's infowarslife.com or call 888-253-3139 Joe Banks here with InfoWars.com. Now, today I saw a video that's going pretty viral. It is of a grandmother, uh, an older lady, Arabic lady, who was telling ISIS, you know, some uh, soldiers for ISIS, that what they're doing is not of a law, that God would not condone these acts of violence, terrorism, beheading people, burning people, executing people by the thousands all over the country for this caliphate that they say is going to rise and take over the world. This lady tells them to turn back to God and basically that they're a bunch of garbage and trash. But there's a very interesting part in the video. I don't know if a lot of people have caught it, but in the video, the grandmother says that, why are you using the weapons of the Americans? We know that you're getting them from them. And the ISIS uh, soldiers go, yes, you're right, grandmother, about that. We've been saying this for a long time, that ISIS is funded by the CIA, by American government. We've shown you time and time again. I mean, Hillary Clinton came out and said that, yes, you know, Al-Qaeda, we funded them. You know, we, we're the ones who helped start them. The people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. The entire world sees this, except for the sheeple in America, the ones who just turn on Fox or CNN and believe whatever propaganda BS is being pushed in their face. And, you know, the funny thing is, is President Obama could literally get on TV, say that we started ISIS, and half of the people in America would not even listen to that. They would just go on ahead and flip over to the Kardashian show or the Simpsons or something like that and ignore the truth right here in front of them, that our government is about to send more soldiers in to fight a group of terrorists that we created. More American lives are going to be lost over something like this, and this is ridiculous. This is something that we've got to stand up and say no to. All these wars are leading to nothing. They've been for nothing. They're a waste of time. But let's go ahead and get to the video. Watch the video. Tell me what you think afterwards like this, and please share it with people who actually think that ISIS is just this organization that just came up out of nowhere and is now dominating uh, the Middle East. <laughs> Well, 
يكفرون من قبلكم لما ظلموا وجاءتهم رسلهم بالبينات وما كانوا ليؤمنوا كذلك نجزي القوم المجرمين Every year we make resolutions to lose weight and get in shape. And the truth is it's hard, even with diet and exercise, because of toxic food in our environment that is stressing our bodies more than ever before. Working with experts in nutrition and biochemistry, I found that super high quality nutraceuticals, in addition to my diet and exercise, were the answers that synergistically worked. I can see the drastic changes every day with the amount of weight I've lost, my increased stamina, and more of a twinkle in my eye. That's why we are now so excited to launch the InfoWars Life Resolution Pack, combining three essential formulations, oxygen-based cleanser oxy powder, the secret 12 bioavailable vitamin B12, and your choice of super female or super male vitality. Now all available at a discounted price to you and your family to bring in the new year and make 2015 a true success. That's InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. 2015 is the year to do it and it all starts at infowarslife.com Introducing Secret 12, the new InfoWars Life Vitamin B12 formulation. Most forms of vitamin B12 are highly processed and synthetic and could not be properly absorbed by the body. That's why for real results, so many are having to turn to painful B12 injections, which are known to have higher absorption rates. Now, InfoWarsLife.com is excited to announce that we can bring you our most bioactive, powerful form of B12 that has been developed with our exclusive perfected process. Secret 12 is a binary of nutramedical grade bioavailable coenzyme forms of B12, methylcobalamin, the same kind used in B12 injections, and adenosyl cobalamin. Secret 12 is simply taken by mouth, right on the tongue, and then swallowed. No needles, no injections. Don't take my word for it. Try it for yourself. Discover the secret. Secret 12. Secure your revolutionary Secret 12 formula right now at InfoWarsLife.com or call 888-253-3139. Joining us today is the Executive Director of the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. This is a nonpartisan professional association of physicians of all types and specialties. It's been around since 1943. And I wanted to talk to them because this is their mission statement. They say they're dedicated to the highest ethical standards of the oath of Hippocrates and to preserving the sanctity of the patient-physician relationship and the practice of private medicine. I think that's a paramount issue as we're talking about informed consent and the push to make uh, vaccines mandatory. And joining us now is the executive director. This is Dr. Jane Orient, MD. She is the executive director of the AAPS and has been in solo practice in general medicine since 1981 and is a clinical lecturer of medicine at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Orient. Thank you for confronting this very important topic. Now, we've had calls this last week, uh, California, where we had the Disneyland measles outbreak happen. Uh, we've had five legislators, state legislators there, have introduced a bill to end exemptions for personal belief, for religious exemptions. And Governor Jerry Brown has come out saying that uh, he thinks he needs to look at this again, as well as Senators Feinstein and Boxer. They really don't seem to care if patients have consent. And I guess the other part of that is the information, and we can talk about that, because there seems to be, from my standpoint, not a, as a patient, not as a doctor, there seems to be very little information that is, in the first place, given to patients. We're told to just shut up and get our kids vaccinated. But uh, it's very important that we have an informed consent. That's that is the situation in civilized countries with all medical procedures, sort of established in Nuremberg yes. back in the late 1940s. And these people who are talking about overriding it really want to practice public health on the population as a herd rather than practicing medicine. And these are two very different disciplines. When you're practicing medicine, you really have to put the needs of your patient first and not be saying, well, I can harm my patient as long as the population as a whole is better off. And, and that's you, you pointed out that this is something that's been there since the Nuremberg trials. It was the Nuremberg Code that basically said, 
You cannot do things that will harm your patient, even if you argue that it's for the greater good. That's the crux of the issue, because if we throw out the idea that we need to optimize things for the individual in some vague public uh, good, we're not going to have the public good because the public is made up of individuals. This is true, and, and this is really the big difference between a totalitarian government such as the National Socialist, who said the individual really has to be subservient to the state. Individuals don't count. It's only the state as a whole that counts. You had a very good information sheet about mandatory vaccines at your website, uh, AAPS. And one of the things that I thought was interesting, it was a bullet uh, list of, of facts. Uh, 42 states have mandatory vaccine policies, you say, and many children are required to have 22 shots by the first grade. That's absolutely amazing. So we've already got mandatory vaccination. They're just trying to push this to another level of public awareness, I believe, because I think once we have uh, some outbreak of uh, a very serious disease like Ebola, it's very likely that they may force people to take vaccines that they haven't even pretended that they've tested. Well, this is a, this is a prospect that a lot of people are afraid of. It's, it's really... It's really appalling to me that the vaccine safety studies are so limited and that people want to just completely disregard the vaccine adverse event reporting system, which is probably, if anything, under reports, even though the reports are themselves not confirmed, that a lot of bad things happen to people who take vaccines. And they, public health officials may assert that the, the benefit is far outweighs the risk. Well, I'm not so sure that that that's true. If you don't know exactly what the risk is, then how can you say that? Speak to uh, the one of the facts that you had here. You said that on the physician's desk reference, they say that there's only a 1% chance of adverse reactions to a hepatitis B vaccination. And yet you extrapolate that out with uh, 70 million patients. That's a large number of people who are going to have an adverse reaction, isn't it? Well, 1% is a really, really high rate. Now, if we're talking about environmental things or the EPA, they would say that even for occupational risks, the risk should be less than one in 10,000. Hey, this is a risk of one in 100. And for mandatory risks that the population has to just accept, they're talking about one in one million. Yes. So vaccine risks, risks are much higher than that. And people do sometimes die of the vaccines. And you can say, well, Maybe it was a coincidence they would have died anyway, but if you can't find any other really good cause for it, and it happens right close to the vaccine, what, I mean, what is the logical conclusion to draw? You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the EPA and the fact that they have a very different set of standards for environmental exposure versus exposure to adverse effects from these pharmaceutical drugs. I was just talking uh, this last week to Dr. Dunn with an organization that has been looking at EPA testing on humans. And as they're pointing out, this is violating the Nuremberg Code according to the EPA's own data. They're exposing people to fine particulate matter that is 70 times higher than what they've said is allowed. And they have said in congressional testimony, Lisa Jackson, director of the EPA, said that the levels that she was talking about would not just make you sick, it would kill you. Nevertheless, the EPA is exposing people to 70 times that amount. This organization that Dr. Dunn was uh, speaking for had tried to get an injunction to stop this. But the judges so far have not stopped this. So we've seen these experiments going on in North Carolina, in California. Now back in North Carolina, they are specifically looking for black teenagers who suffer from asthma, and they are hooking them up directly to diesel exhaust pipes. Can you believe that? It's pretty hard to believe in the medical schools in which this is occurring are accepting it. I, mean, I, th I think the EPA knows very well that it is lying about the effects of these particulate matter. So either they're, they're just lying to Congress and imposing all these billions of dollars worth of regulations on us on what they know are lies, or they are deliberately exposing these people exactly. to, to uh, things that will harm them and maybe even kill them. It's, it's either one or the other. But the thing I find very dangerous, Dr. Orient, is that by the medical uh, schools, the medical uh, oversight committees within the state, the federal court system and the EPA bureaucracy by them all saying, we've set these levels up and yet we're going to expose people to these levels that should kill them. Even if that's not true, even if those levels are not true, what they've done is they've established a legal precedent that 
is in violation of the Nuremberg Code and should trouble us all, especially when we see them pushing for mandatory vaccines. Exactly. And the, the whole purpose of these experiments is to hurt somebody. That's why they're doing it. They're yes. trying to find a toxic effect. In fact, you know, ethical experiments are for the purpose of helping people, not of demonstrating a harm. That's right. And as they pointed out, you can never get informed consent for something that is going to cause somebody a great deal of harm. One of the other things I wanted to talk to you about was you had a FOIA request uh, in April of 2012 that you sent to the CDC asking for information about vaccines. I thought it had some very, very strong points. There were 12 points in there. We don't have time to go over all of them. One of them, the very first one that you asked for, you wanted documents and emails that would describe conflicts of interest in any members of any committee that recommended a vaccine. That's one of the key things that people aren't looking at is not only the conflict of interest within the medical community, within the CDC, who's supposedly overseeing this as an independent, uh, not involved uh, third party that is, is uh, basically referee in this, but we also have a fundamental conflict of interest in the media because they are so heavily funded by the pharmaceutical industries. Did you get any information or any answers on that FOIA request? No, we have gotten nothing whatsoever. They have stonewalled us, just as they did a couple decades ago when we sent a request asking for information about the safety studies of using hepatitis B vaccine in newborns. Mm. No reply at all. I suppose to get a response to a FOIA, even though they're required by law to give it, you have to go to court to sue them, and we haven't undertaken to do that yet. It's very expensive. And if... and. In the long run, you might not get the information anyway. Yeah, we have to. That's the thing about uh, freedom of information requests. You have to rely on the fact that they've given you all the documents that they have. And we have no way of knowing that because everything our government does anymore is kept as a closely guarded secret from the public. Let me read some of the other uh, questions that you had, because I think this really speaks to the issue of informed. They say they don't want our consent, but they're not informing us. You asked, what is the duration of protection by vaccines? What studies have you done on that? You asked, what is the safety and efficacy testing of the influenza vaccine? Describe any testing of thimerosal and other vaccine components for potential adjuvant effects. Where's the information on that? Do we have that information that uh, we can give to our patients? We don't, do we? As far as I know, we don't. I, I don't think it has turned up on any literature searches. And so the source of it would be the CDC. Did they? check into it. Does it exist or doesn't it? And see, it exists and just hasn't been published yet, but I can't find it. And that's the thing. Even though they will list uh, side effects on the pharmaceutical inserts, uh, not just vaccines, but all of them, they don't, in most cases, give you an idea of what the risk percentage is so that you can evaluate it yourself. They're just throwing these numbers out. We see them talking about how the efficacy of their vaccine is 99%. And they say that as they're talking about the number of people who were vaccinated twice who still came down with measles. In that particular instance, in this Disneyland outbreak, they've had 14% uh, of the people who were vaccinated. In the incident the previous year, they had 18% of the people in a measles outbreak were vaccinated. Yet they continue to tell us that it's 99% effective. And prior to that, uh, Dr. Orient, back in 2011, I'm sure you're aware, in New York, they had a measles outbreak there that began with a twice vaccinated person. She was patient zero, the index patient, and she was able to transmit that to four other people who had also been vaccinated. Two of them had records that they had been vaccinated twice. So they wanna tell us that you can't actually get a real case of measles and you can't actually uh, transfer that to other people. And yet in the science literature and science magazine, they pointed out the reason she was able to spread it to so many people was because they believed that it was not contagious even if she came down with it as a vaccinated patient. That is an astonishing case, and it's not something the media obviously is talking about. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. And I guess we continually hear that the science is settled, and yet if they haven't done any, any studies and they don't have any figures on the safety and the efficacy of the influenza vaccine, on the duration of protection, on the uh, effects of thimerosal and other issues, and of course they did have a paper that was published on the effects of thimerosal uh, about, I think it was in 2002, and uh, that eventually showed up. Dr. Hooker uh, found that and, and exposed that. So for that paper to be put into, uh, uh, be part of a proceeding, it had to have the approval and the knowledge of the people at the top of the CDC, and yet they say that they haven't really uh, found any connection with thimerosal or vaccines. Perhaps it's because 
they're in most cases they're not looking, but they did look at least in one particular case. Well, certainly if you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. And if you do happen to see it, then they may tell the physicians to shut up because the science is settled and we're going to ruin you. I mean, they won't say that outright, but that has happened if you want to speak out against it. I guess what troubles me is is the cheerleading that is going on. And uh, for many on the left, many people, ironically, I would say, would call themselves pro-choice on abortion. And yet when it comes to vaccinating your children, they just say, shut up and get your damn kids vaccinated. That's what we hear over and over again from them. We've had uh, the LA Times is pushing uh, the uh, uh, the end of exemptions in California very hard. The uh, editorial piece that came out last week, uh, the title was California moves to end personal belief exemptions for vaccinations at last. That was the op-ed piece. And I have to tell you, Dr. Orient, when they covered uh, Jerry Brown, they say he preserved religious exemptions to state vaccinations back in 2012, but now he is open to legislation that would eliminate everything but medical exemptions. The LA Times then talks about the governor's new flexibility. Flexibility, when you mandate stuff. <laughs> exactly, and they're really turning these parents into pariahs. They're shunning them. They're confronting signs in the physician's office that if your child isn't vaccinated, I'm not going to see them because they're, they, are, they are endangering the other patients in my waiting room. Michael Reagan called children who were unvaccinated typhoid Marys. Really? As if you could get measles from somebody who didn't have measles. I mean, just being unvaccinated doesn't mean you have the disease. Yes. It just means maybe you're going to catch it more than other people if you get exposed to it. And the but idea as, being that they're trying to sell us is that a vaccinated person cannot transmit the measles. They may have, according to the insert, measles-like symptoms, but they can, cannot transmit that. And yet we saw that happen in 2011. In that case in New York, we saw that happen. I, I'm very disappointed to hear that he, he's jumped on the bandwagon as well, but he perhaps may have a lot of pharmaceutical sponsors. I don't know. That's the other part of the problem, is the conflict of interest in the media. The media has jumped all over this. And of course, uh, Megyn Kelly, who was excoriated by the left for uh, last year for saying that everybody knew that Santa Claus was white, and then she should have been excoriated for that. But nevertheless, they're now applauding her because she says sometimes you need Big Brother, and this is a time when we need to have Big Brother. Talk to us about this whole idea of herd immunity and the idea that you can somehow have herd immunity even if the vaccine can't provide uh, immunity to individuals. Well, of course, they're constantly talking about this and sort of assuming that you're stupid if you suggest something that, that may be... <laughs> Vaccines are not all that, that they're cracked up to be. Uh, it, it's offensive that it's a veterinary concept anyway. And I've seen different un estimates as to the percentages of vaccinated people that you need in order for it to have a, an effect. The concept, of course, is a good one that if a, the virus runs into people who are not susceptible, then it kind of has a dead end for being transmitted among the population. How many does that take? Maybe 70%? Maybe 90%, maybe 95%. Well, 91% of American children are vaccinated with MMR, except in some pockets where they have a lot of exemptors. But we have this huge adult population that is probably still susceptible. And so we may not have any herd immunity at all yeah. for measles. And we've only been protected because we have manage to keep new cases from entering the country, or we have, when they happen, we isolate them and cut off the, the transmission that way. Back in the 1960s, early 1960s, before they had a measles vaccine, uh, according to the CDC's own figures, uh, the death rate of uh, people getting measles was 0.01%. In other words, when you get measles, you had a 99.99% chance you would not die. That's one in 10,000. Now they're telling people that it is one in a thousand. Uh, do you have any information as to why that would have gone up by a factor of 10 after they started well, the vaccines? One possible, one possible cause might be that back in, the, in 1960, most of the people who got measles were between the ages of five and nine. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we have a, a change in the age distribution. A lot more of them are infants who are more vulnerable and they're vulnerable because they're not getting antibodies from their mothers. It used to be I mean, if your mother had the measles, then she had a lifelong immunity and she passed these, this passive immunization onto her babies that lasted for 12 to 15 months. So it got them through the first really rocky period. And the other thing is that a lot, a lot of 
more people are getting it in adulthood. And like mm-hmm. chickenpox, uh, other childhood diseases hit adults much harder. They're much more likely to get the complications. And of course, that's why they add the adjuvants to try to stimulate an immune s- uh, response to these uh, weakened or in some other types of vaccines actually uh, dead. Uh, although in the case of MMR, they are weakened and not dead. But I, I think it's kind of uh, uh, kind of like the idea that uh, you may not recognize somebody if you just casually meet them, but uh, if they tried to kill you, you're going to remember them throughout the rest of your life. In a sense, maybe that's what's happening with the immune system's memory about these diseases. If you actually catch these diseases individually, perhaps your uh, immune system uh, creates an, uh, an autoimmune system, uh, a, re- a response, immune response to that that's going to last quite a much longer, and as you point out, would be uh, some something that would be transmitted to uh, children at an early age as well. Well, and there's a problem with the adjuvants. They do stimulate the immune system, but Mm -hmm. that's sort of a nonspecific thing. And what if you have a peanut butter sandwich at the same time that you have been injected with these adjuvants? We have a huge increase in food allergies in children. And so many children are going to school with EpiPens or with asthma inhalers. Mm -hmm. And this is a new situation. I think a lot of parents would probably back off on their resistance to vaccines. If we could just show them a study that vaccinated children were a whole lot healthier than unvaccinated children, but we're not going to have such a study. And if we did, it's probably going to show the opposite because Mm -hmm. look, look at all of these autoimmune conditions that we have. And that's the important thing is the lack of studies, certainly the lack of studies that we're being shown. Perhaps they have studied it privately, but they're not releasing the information. But the key thing, I believe, is the doctor-patient relationship. And as we see the government coming in and increasingly operating as an intrusive third party to dictate how we're going to be treated, what we're going to be given, there's a real danger. And we're seeing this now with these mandatory vaccines. We, we have to close now. We're out of time. But could you just give us one more statement talking about how important it is that we have informed consent, how important it is that we maintain that relationship between the doctor and the patient and keep out intrusions of third parties. The patient-physician relationship dating back to the oath of Hippocrates is that the physician should do no harm. He should not kill his patient. There's nothing in there about being subservient to the good of the collective or the good of the state. Now, physicians can be wrong, but they can only harm as many patients as they can see. If we have the government dictating policies to us and it's the wrong policy, they can harm millions of people. Very important as we look at the idea of mass vaccinations done without people's consent. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Orian, and thank you for your organization that speaks out for real medical ethics. Thank you. Thank you. That's AAPS. Again, that was Dr. Jane Orian, MD. She is the AAPS Executive Director, and they are really concerned about the sanctity of the patient-doctor relationship, and so should you be. Now, that's it for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel there. If you want to support our operation, and we would certainly appreciate that, please get a subscription to Prison Planet TV. That's something you can share with up to 20 people can watch the news each night as it happens simultaneously and, of course, have access to all of Alex Jones' documentaries. Join us again tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. In the past decade, we have witnessed unparalleled scientific discoveries in the area of health. But no one has put together a formula that focuses directly on brain health, nerve growth factors, and optimizing your cellular energy at the same time. DNA Force is one of the most expensive formulas to produce. Some of the ingredients in DNA Force are $12,000 a kilogram. We are using the coveted, patented, only American source of PQQ, CoQ10, and more. You want the best that's out there at the lowest price anywhere? Well, we're bringing you a total win-win. The ultimate value, cutting-edge, trailblazing game changer that also supports the info war. We have produced a limited run of DNA Force, and it will take up to 12 weeks to produce more once we sell out. Secure your DNA force today at InfoWarsLife.com or call toll-free 888-253-3139. DNA Force from InfoWars Life. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.